お水をください。Welcome to Conversations, Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater and musical figures of our time. Our guest today for the first of a two-part chat is the distinguished sound designer and composer Mark Gray. Welcome to Conversations, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, congratulations on your new marriage. Thank you. That's yes. wonderful. Very exciting. I thought I would introduce your, uh, your illustrious co career. It's really a it's a, a wonderful career um, that you've, uh, after two decades as a sound designer, by now you have uh, you've done, you've premiered major works for such composers as John Adams, Steve Reich, mm -hmm. Terry Riley, the Kronos Quartet, and many others. And uh, you've worked on Broadway, you've worked at the Metropolitan Opera, you've worked sometimes on all of the above, all at once. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, you were the uh, sound designer and soundscape engineer for uh, uh, John Adams on the trans Transmigration of Souls. Yes. Uh, a wonderful piece. Yes. And uh, uh, you've worked at the New York Philharmonic, the Lyric Opera of Chicago. Uh, you worked at at the Met on Dr. Atomic most recently. That's correct. Yeah, um, the actually the first ever sound sign in that building. Uh, so it after all these years. After all these years. And, uh, you know, set designers and costume designers and lighting designers have been passing through there for decades and decades. And it's about time. Uh, and it's about time. So we're in the 21st century, and it was, it was about time. And, I, and this piece was, uh, uh, you know, created with that kind of... Uh, uh, ability to change the face of opera. And uh, I think that Peter Gelb picking it up and uh, presenting it at the Met was, was a huge step forward in the way we are seeing opera change today. Well, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we just saw last night your, uh, uh, your incredible production of, uh, of Othello at mm -hmm. the Skirball Theater. Um, uh, what do you call that, a symphony mechanique uh, uh, that you did? Yeah, I mean, it's the way in which, um, I mean, my, my background as a composer and as a musician, uh, very early in my uh, academic career, I, I also growing up in, in the Silicon Valley, uh, having technology all around, uh, I realized that um, to actually survive as a composer, you know, you need an uh, alternate uh, form of income sometimes. Some composers teach. Um, and in my case, I decided to uh, explore technology more. So I sought out a, um, uh, um, Alan Strange, who is a, a pioneer in electroacoustic music. Uh, and he was teaching at a California State University in the Bay Area. And started uh, to work with him and uh, start to integrate electronics with live performance, uh, composition, ensembles, orchestra, soloists, uh, typically with concert music. And so the idea of what Othello was, that you, what you saw last night, was essentially um, what Peter and Sellers and myself um, the came up, the director, yeah, um, you know, discussed this work, is looking at it as a, as a horse spiel, as a radio play, something in which, um, you know, uh, of course, radio plays were very large in all over the world you know, before television. But there was a form of Horspiel where avant-garde composers started using that, that medium, uh, in Europe especially, like uh, the composers uh, Kagel, Mauricio Kagel. Right. And uh, so this idea of uh, creating a sonic world um, and an, an alternate reality and to shift the perception of, of a play, of, of text, uh, especially with Shakespeare, 400 years old, uh, for Othello. And we start to take that and transform it into, the, into a 21st century horsepiel, essentially. So last night you, you probably noticed there were everything from handheld microphones. Uh, with cell phones. To cell phones and, and uh, wireless body microphones and, and whatnot. But it's, uh, it's taking that technology and using it in, in more of a, um, a creative way. 
uh, to explore the text of the work, the, the language of the play, uh, the, the character roles themselves become larger than life. I, I was most fascinated with the fact that you were there in live time uh, adjusting things and uh, creating as, you, as, as another player, mm. almost. Uh, we, I'd never seen that done before. Absolutely, and uh, a along with this, this radio play, uh, I essentially underscored um, quite a bit of it. And it's very, very subtle underscoring. Sometimes it's, it's like a Leggetti sound cluster that's just coming in just under the breath of, say, John Ortiz when he has a, uh, a monologue. The man who played Othello. Uh, who plays Othello. And, and so it, 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 these surges that happen under the breath of the, the text and of the, uh, the character development. So when we see Iago meeting up with Rodrigo and kind of taking him aside and, and plotting how they're going to uh, uh, um, you know, create this shifty world, it's, it's very interesting because I'll, I will use uh, these motifs, these sonic relationship motifs. Sometimes they're wind, sometimes they're sound clusters, and they come in and they, they essentially um, create an en environment much like film does, essentially. But we're, it's, it's almost like we're creating a film in real time. In now, that case. now we have some photographs of uh, of the production. No two performances were alike. Is that correct? That's correct. Because actually, uh, composing the the score in real time, actually, as this every night, this production is so different because the cast takes it to a totally different place. They they start to find new relationships within each other, within their characters, uh, and they bring that to the stage. So what I do is I I I, I walk right alongside that as their shadow, essentially. As another player, really. Exactly. Precisely. Now, did, uh, uh, were they responding some nights to what you were doing as well, or were you always shadowing them? Did they, did they sometimes shadow you? Absolutely. There's, there, there are times, uh, and with this production is especially, as you'll notice, um, there's, uh, uh, there are several uh, video monitors. It actually is uh, technically um, a video screen bed, so it, it, it is the bed of um, uh, Othello and Desdemona, but it actually, if you get a, if there's a kind of far, farther shot of it, you'll see it's actually a hand right. as well, and uh, the way it kind of arcs up and bends in the back. And so uh, what I decided to do was actually these, some of these soundscapes Th they're all in surround sound, so there are speakers around the entire audience, uh, as well as all over the stage. So, a as also uh, a speaker under the bed. So, at times when they're uh, in a in a moment between, say, um, Othello and Desdemona, all of a sudden this this surge of sound that's very very maybe dark ethereal uh, soundscape. It, it feels like it's coming from the bed. And which it actually is. It's coming from the stage, surging up through, kind of through the bed. And so it's using also s spatialization of the room that in which we're working in to create uh, a, a, an experience that becomes three-dimensional, something typically film and television don't do at this time because of the, the, the limitations of two-dimensionality. This um, is an absolutely revolutionary uh, uh, way of doing things. Mm. I, I, was, I was really blown away with Thank that. you. Thank uh, you. Uh, originally, you were from San Francisco, is that right? Yeah, from Palo Alto. That's correct. Yeah, I grew up in Palo Alto. My and you were educated mainly in California? That's correct. Yeah, my father was at Stanford University teaching. <coughs> now, you've worked in all over the world at this point. And um, as a composer, you're, you're best known for two recent works that you did with the uh, Phoenix uh, um, it's the Phoenix Philharmonic, uh, Phoenix, Phoenix Symphony, Symphony. Yeah. Uh, the summons and enemy slayer, Correct. Uh, a Navajo oratorio. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, your do the two careers do they feed each other? They do. Uh, what's interesting? How does about that work? Yeah, it's it's very interesting because uh, again, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the, this idea of um, composers having alternate careers, uh, a day job 
per se. As opposed to waiting tables. Exactly, it, precisely. And, and in this case, uh, what I, I realized very early um, when I was in, in college that I wanted to be out with artists that are touring and that are creating on the fly, real time performance art. And uh, I found very early in the early 90s, I hooked up with John Adams. Um, I was teaching the summer arts program at Cal Arts, uh, just outside of Los Angeles. And uh, John came down to do a master class, and we hit it off. And he said, uh, I was driving him back to the Burbank Airport, and he said, hey, you want a job? And you know, he's, he lived in Berkeley, and I was living in the Bay Area. I said, sure, you know, I'll come over and let's, let's start talking about some things. And, and uh, it started a very long, um, wonderful relationship with him. Uh, and he's been, he's been a musical mentor for as long as we've known each other uh, on so many levels. Um, conceptually, when we're dealing with orchestras or opera format or you know, looking, the ability to be able to deal with large formats of music uh, and to sustain the energy and not to, um, you know, to, to really understand what the craft is. And John, of course, by the time I had met him, had already uh, been through uh, Nixon in China and they were just finishing uh, the Death of Klinghoffer, the, the co-production in that. So I, I you know, being around John, uh, and then shortly after, I started working with Kronos Quartet as one of their mm -hmm. touring sound designers. And so for, I think, probably 13 years with Kronos, I, I traveled all over the world with them. So literally, any place you can put a string quartet uh, Which performed. is anywhere. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I basically, I received a call one day in the Bay Area saying, uh, uh, from the quartet management, saying, can you fly to Oslo tomorrow? Uh, and it just was, you know, I had worked with them generally before that, on and off. But this was really a serious, like, you know, we need somebody to come in and, and really kind of help out right now. And uh, I said, sure. So we did a 10-day Norwegian tour, and then our tour ended at the... the um, the concert house in Vienna, and you know that's my first tour with them. So, all of a sudden, uh, it it starts to expand itself. The the repertoire in my card catalog, as far as you know, these are things that you can't necessarily learn. Uh, say when I was in graduate school, you know, because now I'm out doing it, right? And now I'm I'm actually out, you know, physically working with all these composers that pass through the Kronos web, you know, performers, musicians, venues, I mean, you know, they've opened most major venues lately, like we, as we were speaking with Bard, you know, with right. the, the, the theory holder. So it's, and that's just one example of, of, you know, over a decade of work with them. And so as far as with my music composition, <coughs> that was one, one aspect uh, to help support me financially was to work within technology, but all the time writing music uh, when I'm off tour and, and when I actually am touring as well. Um, but when I get home to my composing studio, I can focus solely on that. I don't have to worry about, you know, paying the rent for the next six months, say, you know, after doing right. a nice long tour. So I didn't have the obligations that come with, say, coming back and, uh, you know, coming back into a university situation where maybe I was teaching and you know, there was always progressive uh, things. More interruptions, up. but more flexibility. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so uh, you know, us, of course, working with John for all of these years and this, this idea of size of orchestra and size of uh, musical um, ingenuity and, and where what you can do with these, these forces. Um, Michael Christie of the Phoenix Symphony, he, he approached me some years ago to um, write a work for their 60th anniversary. And so I went down to Phoenix. Uh, I was living in New York at the time and, and decided to um, look at Navajo creation stories and try to figure out a way to infuse what the um, Southwest is and how Phoenix fits into that, that fabric. And so I, I felt I was starting to touch on something very unique. Uh, because you know, most composers that, that approach 
indigenous uh, peoples of this country. Um, they might take a transcription of one of their stories, but in fact, these stories are sacred stories and they're part of a ceremonial process. And so to take that out of context is actually fairly a taboo for them. A desecration. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's, that's where a lot of the indigenous people of this, of this country have a problem with the way they portray Native Americans and say, you know, Pocahontas. I mean, it's, it's, there are a lot of stereotypes that come with that kind of you know, taking of older stories. And we're going to see a piece of that at yeah, uh, we'll we'll the top of the next that. show. Great, great. And so, so the idea of, um, uh, you know, having this freedom, creative freedom, uh, has, has really opened up several doors to be able to kind of pass through if, if I want to work on a music composition solely. And, and in the past decade, most of my music has been, has been acoustic music though I work with all this technology all the time. Uh, so I, I balance it out uh, just internally for myself. Uh, what did you study in school? Uh, I studied formal music education, yeah, I'm music uh, composition. Uh, so again, I, I... Counterpoint, et cetera. Yeah, sight singing, sight reading, you know, the... The, the works. You name it, yeah, you know. Counterpoint classes, uh, music history, you know, musicianship, the whole thing. Uh, trombonist, uh, very early, studied piano for a little while and uh, ended up playing guitar and have been a guitar player ever since. So, I, I've all, I'm so glad you're on the show today because I, I wanted to raise a question uh, about, I guess it's the 300 pound gorilla, 400 pound gorilla, whatever <laughs> pound gorilla it is. Uh, the subject of uh, miking in opera, how do you feel? Where do you stand on it? Uh, mm. uh, a lot of people feel that um, opera should be seen uh, as is, so to speak. Uh, yeah. How do you feel about yeah, it? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is, uh, it's, it's a huge elephant when it walks in the room. Yeah. And uh, uh, usually rearing its ugly head. Uh, and People and come to blows practically. Oh yeah, there, there's no doubt. And um, you know, I feel certainly <coughs> operas. I mean, we're we're in an age now where we see opera houses that are four times the size of the operas originally when they were composed. The house's capacity. So something that was, say, premiered at La Fenice in Venice is all of a sudden being put at the Met. You know, you have, there's a, a serious differentiation between the size of the hall. And uh, you have challenges that come with that. And I think certainly with the traditional works, uh, I, I'm very much, um, you know, going in and trying to put microphones on principal singers and chorus for, say, Tosca or something is, is not something I would, I would, uh, necessarily do myself, and it's something that uh, I don't promote, because I feel certainly the piece was written in a specific way, where in the contemporary world where we live now, you have composers such as John Adams or Steve Rice, who are writing music <coughs> that is specifically written with sound design, sound amplification involved with their concept of the piece, such as Dr. Atomic, such as The Death of Klinghoffer such as Nixon in China. Um, you know, these, these ideas of, uh, you know, shifting the boundaries of what is opera, what is musical theater. Uh, you know, idea, say, you look at some of John Adams' operas, and it's, a, it's an idea of, it's kind of a pyramid effect, where you have, um, uh, let's say, uh, low strings starting a kind of riff. And right. then maybe the brass comes on top of it, and it it's perpetuates itself. You know, you're creating motion, musical energy. But then you put a mezzo soprano in their lowest r register on top of the woodwinds that have already been put in. As on we top saw in Doctor Atomic. Exactly, and it just it stacks up very quickly. Where when you look at traditional opera, typically the orchestration thins out radically. Right. And you get ornamentation everywhere, and you know, flute whispers here and things that are that are just ornamenting the text 
and the uh, the actual s song itself. Say, I was uh, um, I was I've always noticed that no one mentions in the context of uh, technology and opera how the uh, originally in uh, in theater uh, composers have always made use of the latest technology. The we're no longer playing on harpsichords. Right. Uh, Greek theaters were uh, uh, Greek uh, tragedies, which were sung. Right. Um, the theaters themselves were created uh, so to amplify the sound, and people Absolutely. were uh, the primitive versions of megaphones. Exactly, precisely. So, and, uh, and as we started to get into how different is that from what we have available? Right. Well, except I think in that we're better at it. Well, I think I think certainly you know with the advent of uh, like set design, say. You know, the, the use of certain materials in your set design can become essentially a speaker in and of itself. Right. And so, I mean, that they started to use those kind of tricks, you know, when they would write, uh, when a composer would write some, some dense musical passage with, say, a soprano in a low register or a, a bass baritone in a low register, that, uh, you know, there are ways to compensate for those acoustic issues. and and. A lot of these pieces were designed and written for venues, you know, and, and so now we have a situation where we have uh, opera presentation at, say, Royal Albert Hall in London, and, you know, it's a six, six plus thousand seat venue, and, you know, you have to be able to deal with this new technology infused with that older art form to be able to be he heard. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's physical laws of nature. I mean, it's, it's, uh, especially in a building that's not designed, uh, per se for as, you know, with, with Roman amphitheaters, say, that were designed for projection. And so, uh, we're at a time now also with, uh, our, our hearing has changed, uh, the way in which we listen. I mean, this idea of, the idea of recorded music has completely changed the face of the way in which we experience music. Concert music, opera, uh, chamber music, um, recital music, where you can put a disc on, it, you know, used to be wax discs, and now <laughs> we're downloading it. But it's the same concept of the uh, availability of that sound. You can put it on, you can hear it, and you can digest it and you can play Mahler again and again and again. And you know, say, a concert's coming up with the New York Philharmonic, you can listen to Mahler for 500 times before you go see the concert. And we're here, we're walking around with earphones, so we're, our, our approach to sound is different because we're used to a more intimate... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. A as well, and, and what's very interesting is, as you'll see, you know, with uh, organizations that are starting to simulcast, with say opera like the Met, um, is you have a situation that's not the reality of what's actually going on on stage, because you're watching something say at a AMC theater that has very crystal clear sound, and those singers are coming through brilliantly through the theater loudspeaker system, and you're experiencing it in a different way. But it's completely amplified, and it's not the way they hear it in the theater. And you go to the theater, and there's a there's a, the veil of the acoustics that that uh, you know the, the the Met House is is a, a fantastic sounding room. It's incredible. And my director, my my producer is giving me the high sign that believe it or not, our first uh, our first broadcast is uh, is over. Really? Yes. Excellent. Amazing. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> Lots to talk about. Wonderful. Uh, we have a lot more to talk about um, uh, in the next part. Uh, and uh, I wanted to thank you and our sure. home and studio audience uh, for coming today. Let's go out on a performance recording session of Enemy Slayer, a Navajo Oratorio by the Phoenix Symphony. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much.